so far, everything that we've been talking about in terms of this uh, visitation of uh, high school AP physics has been how do point particles behave in the presence of you know, different fields that they interact with, and in particular in the presence of gravity, which is what we just did. Um, we have a coordinate system, we have forces that act on things, we have how do things move within that coordinate, some coordinate system based upon those forces. Uh, and now we're going to say, well, what if we move away from individual particles and we start talking about um, a continuous medium of particles, so like infinite number of particles that are all moving um, under the influence of these same forces and stuff like that. One of the problems that you have when it comes to continuous media, so like uh, the ocean, for example, is that if you have a truly continuous medium, it goes on forever in all directions. So, uh, you know, you have water and this whole thing would be filled with water. And if you say, oh, what's the energy, you know, of this stuff, the energy is going to be infinite. So you'd say, what's the energy of this material? The that material is going to have some random kinetic energy. Material is always made out of something. So you're going to have all these particles that are kind of bouncing around. Um, and that's going to be um, a, this random motion contributes to the kinetic energy of the, you add up the kinetic energy of all these individual particles. And you say, okay, how much energy do you have in this medium that goes on forever in all directions? And the answer to that is infinity, which is hard to work with. It's hard to work with infinity. Uh, you might say, okay, what is the, um, what are some other properties that this might have? What's the mass? What's the mass of this medium? Because mass is something that we have to worry about because in individual particles, the energy is going to be like one half mv squared. Uh, so you say, okay, well, what's the mass of this substance? Well, because the substance goes on forever in all directions, then the mass is going to be infinity. And so, uh, again, this is something that, just doesn't work. So you have to come up with a new uh, way to treat continuous media that in principle or at least by approximation go on forever, forever in all directions. So you have to uh, find a way to take something that's infinity in size, the mass of all the material that goes on beyond the uh, extent of the universe or uh, the energy of that same substance. And uh, the way that you do that is that you take a chunk of it. You say, I'm only going to consider how this stuff behaves when I partition it up into small bite-sized pieces. And so the way that you do that is that you say, ah, well, I'm going to take the energy and I'm going to divide that energy by a piece of volume and I'm going to call that something else that is treated like energy. It's an energy density. And the same thing is going to be true with the mass. I'm going to have the mass of the whole substance and I'm going to divide it by uh, some little piece of volume so that I can get just the mass that's contained in some uh, chunk of space that is finite in size and therefore I get a finite mass. And so I'm going to divide this by the volume and I'm going to get some other thing that's a mass density. So these are the things, now that we, we're going to talk about continuous media, we need to say we can no longer work with the total energy or the total mass because those are both infinite numbers. We have to work with bite-sized pieces that are contained within some volume, uh, even if that volume is an imaginary volume. And so we're going to work with, instead of mass and energy, we're going to work with mass density and energy density. Well, mass density has its own symbol. It is the Greek letter rho, which looks like this. And the energy density has its own, let's see, could we just consider mass as one kilogram and then calculate the values of energy volume uh, relative to that kilogram of mass? Uh, we, could, we could look at you know, one kilogram of this medium. Um, however, we'll find that it's easier to divide by a volume because a volume is a fixed uh, unit within the coordinate system. It kind of maps more directly into the coordinate system and it allows you to treat all substances the same instead of because each individual substance is going to have its own density. Uh, so the mass density here. And so each individual substance is going to have its own density. And so instead of having to do that calculation separately for each individual substance, you divide by the volume and then the density becomes a property of the substance and not a property of your particular problem. Um, all right, and so the energy per unit volume, the energy density, this is given by the pressure. So this is P for pressure, and this is rho for density. So in this case, P is for pressure instead of momentum because there's only 26 letters in the alphabet and there are so many wonderful physics principles that we have to start to double assign the letters that go along with everything. So pressure is energy density, and or at least it has units of energy density. There is a slight... Um, 
distinction because energy can be contained in both kinetic and potential energy. Uh, the pressure is actually related to the kinetic energy density um, that we'll see uh, as time goes on when we talk about this. Uh, energy per unit volume is indeed equivalent to force per area. So let's take a look at that. So this, most people think of pressure as like pounds per square inch. Pounds is a force. Um, the unit of mass, so kill, here, here's something useful to know um, so that you can amaze your friends at parties because that's all that we really care about is being able to amaze your friends at parties, that the mass, um, mass is measured in kilograms, uh, weight, is measured in newtons, newtons like this. Weight is also measured in pounds, uh, LBS. So pounds and newtons, uh, those are, have both have units of weight. It's a force. Newton is a force. Pounds is a force. Uh, mass in the British system is not measured in kilograms. It is measured in slugs. So a person has so many slugs of mass, and then you multiply by the gravitational constant, um, like the little g, and that gives you your weight. So let's take a look at this. Uh, my claim that pressure has units of energy density. Uh, it also has units of pounds per square inch. So what's going on fundamentally is, so you have some volume like this. Okay, again, this can be an imaginary surface, but it need not be an imaginary surface. You have particles that are bouncing around inside here with some uh, of their own kinetic energy. And that's gonna come and it will bounce off of the walls of the surface and redirect it. Um, or in another way to think about it is these walls, uh, if you had a room, for example, these walls are going to experience force as the particles bounce off of the walls and they change their momentum. So that change in momentum is going to be related to a force, right? Because forces cause changes in momentum. And so you look at how that momentum change is going to exist and then what is keeping everything stable and you end up getting how much force there is being exerted on the walls uh, you know, continuously because they're, the particles, the substance that makes up the fluid in this chamber is the particles are so small that you can treat it as though it's a continuous property instead of being made up of individual particles. So you're going to get force per uh, force divided by area. Um, the pressure is going to be force divided by, so this is momentum in this case, um, but how much force is being exerted on this wall and then you have to partition that wall up into a finite size because it would be infinite. If you had an infinite wall and you have an infinite fluid, then you're gonna have an infinite force. So you partition it up into some surface area uh, or some area, you get force per unit area and you call this the pressure. And so uh, force times distance is has units of energy and area, area times a distance has unit of uh, volume. And so this is going to be uh, energy per unit volume. And so energy per unit volume has the same units as force per unit area, uh, which is units of pressure. So the pressure is related to the energy density of some substance, how much, and in particular, the kinetic energy density of the substance. But um, so, so there you go. This is actually kind of an interesting thing to consider. So pressure has, uh, is related to energy density you can convert it to a force once you know uh, how much you know how much area that energy density is impinging upon but there's another thing to consider and that is uh, going back to one dimensional uh, behavior in one dimensional behavior you might have like a string so here's a string like this and you pull on the string and it develops tension so basically you're straining all the bonds in that string uh, it will it can cause the particles to vibrate more rapidly because you're adding energy to the system. And so you'll have an energy per unit length. Uh, energy per, per unit length. <clears throat> and this, uh, well, energy is a force times a distance. And so an energy per unit length is going to be, in this case, uh, something. Well, energy is a force times a distance, so that means this has to be a force. Energy per unit length has to be a force. So you have when you have a continuous medium, in this case it's a one-dimensional continuous medium instead of a three-dimensional continuous medium, you also are going to have some energy per unit length that 
is related to the strain and the motion of the particles that are bonded together in this string. And so the density of energy along the length of the string is a force. It's, um, and so the tension, this is tension in a string, is the energy density in the string. So tension and pressure are related to each other. The tension in a string is equivalent to the pressure in a volume. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's a one-dimensional version of what we're going to be talking about with fluids. Tension in a string is a one-dimensional version of a continuous medium um, fluid and its associated energy density. And I don't know why it just did that, but there, I'm glad that that's gone because that frightened me when that came up. Okay, so now that we have the energy density and we're working with things as they relate to uh, energy, uh, as we work with a substance in terms of its density as opposed to uh, simply working with its mass, I'm gonna move this around just a little bit so that my drawing pad is more centered. <clears throat> That's what fluids is all about, basically. Okay, so what do we know? Well, there are a few properties of fluids to consider. One of them is that you have, um, here's your volume, you've got random stuff that's moving around in here. There's this random motion of the particles that are in here. So random motion. But you can also take this volume and actually bulk have bulk motion of that volume, you know, this chunk of stuff moving in a particular direction. So you can have bulk motion. You have random motion, you have bulk motion. These are both forms of energy. The random motion, um, we're going to call it thermal energy, thermal, and the bulk motion is just the bulk motion of some object. It turns out that the random motion, the thermal energy that something has, and we haven't, this will be something in a later chapter where we go into a bit more detail about, you know, what does it mean for something to have thermal energy? But this random motion of the kinetic energy of the individual constituent particles, it contributes to the random motion of this stuff. That is what contributes to the pressure that's in there. This thermal energy is, uh, it is a form of kinetic energy. The bulk motion that this chunk of material has as it moves through your coordinate space um, is also going to have its own kinetic energy as well. Um, and so they're two different forms of kinetic energy, or at least they're divided up and partitioned uh, into two different forms of kinetic energy. The thermal energy, which is basically the coordinate neutral, where you have uh, the coordinate system attached to this object, and then you would transform that coordinate system into whatever, uh, however it moves, however this bulk of material moves relative to that, uh, to your coordinate system. That would be its own kinetic energy. If you think about this, it's the same amount of mass. So let's say you have some substance with stuff floating around in there. So here's this stuff. It's all, you have this random motion of things going around, and you also have some bulk motion associated with it. The question is, which one has more kinetic energy? Well, the particles that are bouncing around inside here, um, particles that are bouncing around inside here are going to be moving at the sound speed. How? Because sound waves, as sound waves propagate through some substance, it's a disturbance in the, that information so sound waves are basically just pressure waves that are moving through. That information about, let's say uh, you have a bunch of objects that are in here. This thing's going to start wiggling because it gets disturbed. It's going to bump into its neighbor and cause that to start wiggling. And it's going to bump into its neighbor. And so this pressure wave is going to propagate through this medium, but it can only propagate at the rate that the individual particles are moving. It can't propagate faster than the particles themselves are moving. Um, if you have if you did have some disturbance that was moving through this substance faster than the individual particles are moving, what you would get is a shock front. You would have a front where here is this, here's this disturbance moving through faster than the individual particles are moving. These particles here, they're just sitting there bored, like ho-hum, um, saying, you know, nothing is changing for me, everything is normal, and then this front is going to hit it without it getting information from its neighbors. And then all of a sudden, you know, these are all the people who have been informed by this shock front passing through. These are all the particles that have not yet been informed by that shock front passing through. And you're going to get this uh, abrupt discontinuity in the pressure, for example, so in the energy density from one side to the other. So when you have a disturbance traveling faster than the individual particles can move, you get a shock front. And a shock wave is basically when you break the sound barrier. 
So the sound barrier has been broken once that happens. These things are, the sound waves can't propagate uh, over here to inform these people, uh, you know, there's a wave coming, a disturbance is coming, be prepared. And so they are overtaken by the shock front, the abrupt change in pressure. So uh, the speed of sound is basically the speed of the individual particles. If you're going slower than the speed of sound, if you have a, a disturbance that is traveling slower than the speed of sound, you know, sub subsonic pressure wave, then the particles will bounce around, share that information with their neighbors, and it will propagate ahead of your disturbance. But if you have something that's moving supersonic, then that information can't propagate, and so you get this abrupt transition in pressure. All right, so the thermal motion, the random motion here, is the same mass of substance. You know, you have the same amount of substance, it's you know, whatever it happens to be, some number of kilograms per cubic meter, that's moving at this random motion that's at the sound speed in that substance. And then the bulk motion of all that is going to be moving you know, through your coordinate system. Okay, so where is most of the energy stored? Well, it depends on, upon how fast this thing is moving. The sound speed is around 1,000 uh, kilometers per hour. So uh, the speed of sound in the atmosphere at sea level is around 1,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, sound travels a bit faster in solids than it does in fluids, and so the sound speed uh, the, the motion of the particles is going to be a bit higher. What does that mean? So unless this bulk, the bulk motion of something is traveling at a thousand kilometers per hour, then the majority of the energy is going to be in this thermal energy. That's weird. So you have a baseball. Okay, baseball's at some temperature. That temperature corresponds to some random motion of the particles in that baseball. That ba those particles in that baseball are going to be moving um, vibrating around, bumping into each other at a thousand kilometers an hour. And so if you have, if you could extract the thermal energy out of some substance, um, you know, say, say you throw a baseball, let's, let's do it this way. You throw a baseball at what, what's a hundred miles an hour. So that'd be like, well, 60 miles an hour would be a hundred kilometers per hour. So 60 mile an hour, uh, little league fastball is going to be, um, moving at 100 kilometers per hour. That means that only that 10 times the amount of energy, so that baseball is going to hit you and on the side of the head because um, you offended the other player and so the pitcher is going to show you who's boss and so they're going to bean you with it. So they hit you in the, side, in the head with this baseball at 60 miles an hour or 100 kilometers per hour. And you're like, wow, that had a lot of energy associated with it that, that, because my head hurts. There is 10 times the amount of energy just in the thermal motion in that object. So if it also deposited its thermal energy into your head, then it would be um, as though it were traveling much, much faster. You know, that'd be, it would be as though it was traveling at 1100 kilometers per hour uh, to extract that thermal energy. So the thermal energy is not to be trifled with. It is the bulk of the energy up until the point where you're actually traveling at speeds close to the sound speed. So that is uh, pretty, pretty gnarly. Okay. All right, so let's go back and explore what are some of the things that we know about energy um, so that we can now turn our attention to these continuous media problems, like these fluid problems. Uh, well, kinetic energy is uh, one half mv squared, but because the mass is infinite, um, this isn't going to work, and so you have to have a kinetic energy density. So the kinetic energy density is going to look like uh, so in fluid space, it's going to be one half, instead of mass, it's going to be rho v squared. So this is the amount of kinetic energy per cubic meter. So you have some continuous flow of substance through a hose or whatever it might be. And the amount of kinetic energy that goes by per second, or the amount of kinetic energy that you have uh, per unit volume is going to be one half rho v squared. Potential energy. Uh, the potential energy that some substance is going to have would normally be given by mgh. Okay, but m, again, the mass is infinite, and so this is going to be respelled as rho gh. So this would be the gravitational potential energy. This is the gravitational potential energy of a fluid. Uh, one thing to consider here that's a little bit uh, strange is that um, there is a sign difference. This h is usually, uh, you have to take care in your problem which direction plus means and which direction minus means. Um, because the gravity points downwards and the pressure points upwards. But anyway, you're going to have this kinetic energy rho gh. So it's 
how much mass do you have per unit volume and at what height is it going to have? All right, let's see. Uh, what are some other, that's kinetic energy and potential energy. That's basically all we've got. Oh, and then we have the local energy density. So the local energy density is going to be the energy per unit volume, and that's going to be the pressure. Okay, so all of these things, the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the pressure, they all have the same units. This is energy density. It's the potential energy, and it's gravitational potential energy. We don't have a charged fluid in this case. One could imagine having uh, equations where there were, the fluid had electric charge, so you have a fluid of electrons or something like that, in which case you would have a charge energy density or an electrical energy density. Um, but so far, we haven't talked about electricity and magnetism. We've only talked about gravity. And so we're only going to consider neutral fluids with mass and therefore with some density and therefore with some uh, potential energy density. So this is the potential energy density. This is the kinetic energy density. This is the thermal energy density uh, or an approximation to the thermal energy density, at least the components of the thermal en energy density that we need to worry about. Um, later chapters, we go into like what are other forms of thermal energy density or what are other things that contribute to the total thermal energy density. But anyways, here we go. All right, so these things uh, are all going to be related to each other uh, because energy is conserved. And so if you're going to start messing around with any one of these uh, forms of energy, it's got to be moved into one of the other forms of energy. So just like energy was conserved before and you can shift it around between potential and kinetic energy, the same thing is going on here. Energy density is, uh, or energy also has to be conserved, and as long as the density is uniform, so we're going to be talking, initially the book is going to be talking about uh, substances where the density is a constant, uh, is constant. That's not in general true. The density does change, uh, like in the atmosphere, the density changes with depth. Uh, but we're, in this case, we're going to talk about incompressible fluids where the density stays fixed, and therefore, because the density is constant, uh, energy can only be shifted around between these different forms um, instead of um, instead of changing the changing this. So density is fixed. Uh, that will not be true in general, but it's true in the specific instances in this first chapter. Uh, let's see, what was, uh, I wanted to pull this up so that we could see if I'm missing anything. We got this, we got pressure. Um, we got a variation of pressure in the depth of a fluid. Gauge pressure, that's just like the difference in pressure. <clears throat> So because these are all forms of energy, um, just like we, we mentioned with energy before, that there's always some uh, energy is something that depends upon your coordinate system. The amount of potential energy you has depends, have in a system depends upon where you choose your origin to be. The same thing is true in all of these cases. Uh, what does it mean to have velocity? Well, you have to pick a coordinate system, and then you have to have your, this substance flowing through that coordinate system in order to get a velocity. Same thing is true here. In order to have a potential energy, you have to have some uh, zero point that you're measuring the height from. And the same thing is true here with pressure. In order to have some pressure, ener kinetic energy density of your material, you have to choose a pressure to measure it from. Uh, typically it's measured relative to the vacuum, but we don't have a vacuum on the surface of the earth. And so we measure the pressure relative to the local atmospheric pressure or the local environmental pressure. So the gauge pressure is the pressure that you, meet, that you measure at the gauge. It's basically just the offset between what's the atmospheric pressure. So you choose a coordinate, you choose a pressure to measure things with respect to, which is normally atmospheric pressure when we're talking about the surface of the earth. In physics systems, it will often also be um, the, the complete absence of anything. So like the vacuum, zero pressure. Um, so practical purpose, for practical purposes, the pressure is relative to atmospheric pressure for um, hypothetical phys physical systems pressure, it will be the pressure of uh, like zero pressure where there's no, there's no mass, there's no substance, there's nothing moving around. All right. So all of these things, because energy is conserved, they're all related to each other. And so the sum, when you have a system, uh, when you have some fluid that's moving uh, in some direction at some height um, with some temperature, in other, it's got some internal pressure, um, you, because energy has to be conserved, all of these things can only share their energy density uh, because the density doesn't change. They can only share the energy density. And so that means that there's the total of the pressure plus the, uh, what, rho, rho gh, 
So that's the potential energy in the gravitational field plus the one half rho v squared. That's got to be a constant. Okay, and this is why airplanes fly. I knew everyone was wondering that. How do airplanes fly? Well, it's right here. This is why airplanes fly. Okay, how does this work? So airplanes fly uh, in part because you have uh, an aerofoil. So your wing cross section is going to look like this. Um, this is kind of a terrible wing cross, se cross section, but we're going to go with it. Uh, you also have like, there are other things that contribute to this, but this is the main uh, physics principle at play. The air down here is going to move relative to the wing. Uh, so the wing's going to be stationary. The air is going to move relative to it. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You could imagine um, being having fixed air and moving the wing through the air. Either way, it's you know that's just a coordinate transformation. Uh, you're going to have other air that is going to move up over this thing, uh, over the aerofoil. And so the air that moves across this aerofoil, right? It's a continuous medium. So you've got lots of air moving across the top. You've got lots of air moving across the bottom. This air here has to move at a higher rate of speed. So the velocity here, the velocity top, is greater than the velocity bottom. So velocity bottom is down here, velocity top is up there. The velocity at the top has to be greater than the velocity at the bottom. So what does that mean? That means that um, the total energy density has to be conserved across here. Um, the height is not going to change very much. The height might change a small amount, um, but the velocity uh, you know, the, the ratio of the height to the, the line integral across the surface, like how much further it has to travel, is uh, gives you the difference here. And also notice that the velocity goes in squared instead of linearly. Um, and so as the velocity, if the velocity goes up, so all of these things have to add to a constant. So if this thing gets bigger, if this term gets bigger here, this term gets bigger, bigger then these two terms have to get smaller. Smaller. Okay, the height also gets bigger. So it's the part that goes above here. Um, the velocity at the top gets bigger. So that term gets bigger. This one also gets bigger, which means that the pressure has to get much smaller. So the pressure gets smaller where the energy gets absorbed into these other reservoirs. So you have the gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy, uh, well, gravitational potential energy density and the kinetic energy density. These things go up with the air that's moving at a faster rate, and so the pressure at the um, the pressure up here has to drop in order for all of these things to be constant. You compare that to the air that moments before was in exactly the same conditions, and it just slides along the bottom and remains in those conditions, and so the pressure down here must be higher. So you have high pressure underneath, and you have smaller or lower pressure up above, and that gives you lift. Lift. So that's how that works. Um, it's basically conservation of energy um, for a fluid with constant density. Uh, these things, if these things go up, then this has to go down. If these things go down, then this has to go up. Uh, where else does this come into play? This also comes into play in the form of uh, bubbles in a soda pop. Bubbles in soda pop. So here you have your soda pop. It has a lid on it right here. There is pressure that's built up in the interior. You can see this, for example, if you pull out this beverage right here. So space beverage, there's this space beverage, um, cactus cooler, and it's, it's under pressure, right? I squeeze the sides and it responds by pushing back on my fingers. So let's, hold on, I've got to do the camera thing. I'm going to switch to the camera. One moment, please. Just so you can see the, how space beverage this actually is. So let me get out of the way. How do I get out of the way? I come over here. So space beverage right there. Um, that is, uh, it's got pressure in it. So you have this high pressure. Different gases will dissolve, well, in this case, carbon dioxide. Uh, the sub, as If the pressure is higher, then you can dissolve more substance in your fluid. So you have a fluid down here. You have carbon dioxide that is down inside this fluid right here. You relieve this pressure, and now all of a sudden um, this escapes, and the pressure drops down. And so now these bubbles, the bubbles are going to expand because the pressure is lower. The bubbles expand, and then they start to become buoyant, and they rise up to the surface, and you get fizz at the top. So that's uh, another example of how this works. Think of another example. Um, 
So bubbles, if you have bubbles in a fluid and the fluid changes the, its pressure, then the bubbles will grow or shrink depending upon it. So there's a, a particle detector called a bubble chamber. So if you want to detect dark matter, here is a dark matter detector. Um, I can show you a picture of what this dark matter detector looks like. The one that at least I have in mind is Ku Dark Matter. So here is an image of the Ku bubble chamber. So this is a dark matter detector. It looks like this. Um, it's, excuse me, it's run out of Fermilab. You can see this bubble that forms in there. Here's how the Ku dark matter detector works. It's got a plunger. Okay, there's a plunger in here like this with a piston on top of it. You fill it with some kind of solution. It's got, um, I think it's some kind of dry cleaning solution. That's a common thing because it's, you know, we need chlorine, fluorine, something, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyways, they have some kind of fluid in here and it's a super cooled fluid, which means that, um, or I'm sorry, it's a superheated fluid. It means that it would like to boil but it's unable to boil because it has no place, in order for it to boil, it has to form a bubble. So it would like to turn into a gas, um, but in order to turn into a gas, it needs to be able to form a bubble. And in order to form a bubble, it has to push away at the local environment, has to expand the, the gas chamber that it's, uh, they it would like to create, it has to expand it against the pressure from the local environment. And so uh, that's not an easy thing to do. Forming a bubble is difficult. Okay, and so it would like to form a bubble, but it's unable to. Typically what happens when you have some substance, if you take a glass, if you look at a glass of your favorite space beverage, uh, you'll notice that the bubbles actually originate on the sides and they stream up from uh, slight imperfections in the side or the bottom of the container. They don't magically appear in the middle of the fluid. They appear on the side of the fluid and work their way to the top. The reason is that if you have some, if you look at the side of this container and you have like some imperfection because you have hard, hard water or something like that. Uh, the bubble is, it's easier to form a bubble along the sides because it's got less surface area that it needs to push against. So instead of having to push against all three directions, like all directions, it only has to push against less than half of the directions because, um, you know, it's forming on the wall. It's already got this thing. So there's a smaller area that's in contact with the local fluid uh, to form the bubble. And so it's easier to form the bubble here. And so that's, there's your bubble and it comes up and then the next bubble forms after that. So these imperfections reduce the amount of force, uh, the amount of energy required to expand to form the bubble. And so bubbles will form on the side. In this particular fluid for this Ku dark matter experiment, um, the, uh, the bubble would like to form. It should be boiling. It's at, a, it's at a higher temperature than the boiling point, but there's no, the walls are too smooth. So there's no place to nucleate the bubble. And the idea is that your dark matter particle comes in, we'll call it a chi because that's a, canonical, a traditional dark matter particle letter. This particle comes in, hits uh, the nucleus of some substance, causes a disturbance, that disturbance, like a disturbance in the force, that disturbance in the force um, is enough to kind of jar and get things going. It disrupts the, the local conditions a little bit. And so now you open up a bubble and then that bubble uh, would like to rise towards the surface. So what's gonna happen is this bubble forms, you have a camera out here, here's your camera. The camera has a lens on it. The camera is pointed in this direction. It says, has a bubble form, has a bubble form. The camera is connected to a computer that's constantly looking at the images from the camera saying, is there a bubble, is there a bubble, is there a bubble, is there a bubble? Because if there's a bubble, you don't want this whole thing to start boiling. Uh, so you form this bubble, it's gonna, if, if it were left to its own devices, that bubble is enough to cause disturbances everywhere else and it's gonna start boiling. And then you have to cool it down below the boiling point and then raise the temperature back up again. And that takes a long time. So instead what you wanna do is you form this bubble that bubble would like to expand because um, it's got uh, where oh, I already erased everything. It's got uh, the pressure is um, the pressure in the gas is now higher, and so it's going to like to expand, and it will would like to go into pressure equilibrium, which is going to mean that it wants the pressure inside the gas to fall, and as a consequence of it falling, that means that the energy density has to go somewhere else. And so it will go into the rho GH column and it would like to rise. Uh, now you actually, in this case, you have a different density as well because you've transitioned from a liquid to a gas. But anyways, it's gonna, it's gonna try to rise. Um, take that extra energy and put it into this potential energy. So the bubble would like to rise. And uh, what you do 
you take an image, you see that the bubble formed, you record it because that's how you detected this dark matter particle, and then you squish, you raise the pressure out here uh, with the piston. So you see a bubble, the piston immediately you know, goes to the computer, the computer says, uh, shut this down, it immediately squashes it down, that raises the boiling point, basically. Um, squishes the bubble, so now the bubble is flattened, the bubble disappears, and then you slowly raise the uh, piston back up so that you don't cause another bubble to form. So that is a bubble chamber, uh, and this is a result of a bubble chamber um, like that. So this is a, an interaction, this is probably test data, because had it been a dark matter particle, we would have heard about it. Uh, this is probably test data where some neutron or something like that came in, formed this bubble, and then they take a picture of it, and then they squish it down, squish this plunger down, and get rid of it. Okay, so in a variety of places where we use um, this equation that is basically conservation of energy. That's Bernoulli's equation. Uh, Bernoulli, Bernoulli's equation is the thing that is basically conservation of energy. So that's pretty cool. Conservation of energy, Bernoulli's equation, airplanes fly. All right, what else are we missing from this uh, chapter that we need to cover? Um... Oh, Pascal's principle. Oh, I, I guess I skipped into the next one um, to do Bernoulli's equation. There's two other th things in here, Archimedes' principle and Pascal's principle. These are both uh, also kind of useful, and I'm going to see if I can remember exactly which ones they are. Uh, I'm fairly confident in my ability to do this. Pascal's principle. Principle. Uh, so uh, there's a P in here. Okay, Pascal's principle. What Pascal's principle says is that if you have some fluid in some unusually shaped vessel, so here's an unusually shaped vessel, and you fill it with some fluid, that the fluid, the pressure at a given location, at a given height, will be the same everywhere at all times. Um, the, the pressure at this location will be the same as the pressure at this location was, will be the same as the pressure at this location, assuming that they're all the same height. So please ignore the curvature of this line. Pretend that it's all at the same height. So it's going to be some height above there. The pressure is equal everywhere here. Um, that is Pascal's principle. Now, why would this be the case? The fact of the matter is that it's not actually the case. There are going to be pressure variations through any fluid, right? You're going to have sound waves bouncing around. I'm speaking, and therefore the, the disturbances from my mouth are propagating outwards and are causing disruptions everywhere in the world. Uh, everywhere in the world is affected by the fact that I'm speaking. Now, it might be a small amount that it's affected by my speaking, but my speaking is going to cause pressure variations that take place everywhere in the whole face of the planet. Um, and so the question is, like, when is Pascal's principle applicable? Since we know that there can be pressure waves that travel through something, when is something applicable? And the answer to that is Pascal's principle holds true that the pressure only depends upon the depth and it doesn't depend upon the shape of any of the substances above it. Pressure is going to be the same in some fluid everywhere uh, as long as you consider time scales that are longer than the light or than the sound travel time between those two points. So you could have a pressure difference, you know, like right here, you could have a pressure front that's expanding outwards. Okay, that's going to travel at roughly the speed of sound. And so as long as you are considering time scales longer than the, you know, however the size of your object is divided by, so, so you have some size, um, we'll call it S, divided by the speed of sound, right, that gives you um, some velocity, that's going to give you a time, right? Distance equals rate times time, so distance divided by rate is going to be equal to a time. This gives you a time scale. So this time scale, uh, we'll call it tau because I felt like it, and it's fun to draw Greek letters. So this time scale, as long as you're, in your problem, you're considering time scales that are longer than the sound wave propagation time across this thing, then Pascal's principle applies. So, and it's a piece of useful information. Uh, science question. Uh, where do you find this space soda? I only am able to find this space soda uh, cactus cooler at my local Smith's store. So I'm not able to find it at some of the other grocery stores that I frequent, but I'm able to find it. And so I always stock up on cactus cooler because it is space beverage. <clears throat> and it tastes good. All right, so uh, I won't say that it's healthy, but I will say that it tastes good. Uh, and it's possible that Pascal assumed a sealed system. I don't know that that's necessary. Um, because you can have like ambient atmospheric pressure up here. Now here's something that's actually interesting is that my um, 
as I speak, there are pressure differences that are building up um, in my, you know, coming out of my mouth. There is this uh, mathematical thing, uh, mathematical structure or reality, that when you have pressure or temperature conditions on a closed surface, so the surface of the earth is a closed system, you have um, a field across this, you have a scalar field called the you know, pressure, because it's an energy density, it has, it's, it's an energy, energy has no direction, that's just a scalar. Uh, pressure is gonna be some scalar field. Uh, there's gonna be a value of pressure everywhere in across the surface of the earth. Um, and it's just gonna be some number. The earth is gonna have some pr value for the pressure everywhere across its surface at all times. So that is a scalar field. There is this theorem that says that um, whenever you have a closed surface with a scalar field going across it, meaning a scalar field meaning you have a value of some uh, property across that. So a yeah, temperature field is also the same. You're going to have a temperature field across the surface. And so there must be a point uh, somewhere else on the surface of the earth that has exactly the same pressure. So I don't remember what that's called, uh, but let's look it up as long as we have this opportunity. So what is the... Um, Scalar field earth pressure um, equal let's see. No, that's probably so what if I did uh, equal pressure two points on earth? The Borsuk Alam theorem, Borsuk Ulam theorem. Fun math. Uh, facts. Let's look up the borsuk ulam theorem. It basically says, so you have a scalar field um, across some closed surface, and of course it's got this, oh wow, that's like the least informative thing. So if we look at an image, the borsuk ulam theorem, borsuk ulam theorem, So anyways, there's videos that describe um, why this is the case. And it basically says that uh, you're going to get, whenever there's some pressure condition at one location, there must be an identical pressure condition somewhere else uh, on the surface of the earth. So there's this one by um, what, three blue, one brown. An interesting thing to, to look at. We won't look at it here, but uh, interesting video to consider. The Borsuk Ulam theorem. All right, so now we get there. You go. All right, so that's Pascal's theorem. The other theorem, or the other principle that it's looking at, is Archimedes. Uh, Archimedes. Uh, Archim. Let's try that again. Archimedes. Okay, Archimedes theorem is basically saying that, okay, so here is your uh, fluid, it's in here like this. You can have some substance or like some object in here, and there's going to be a force. Uh, this object is gonna feel pressure on it as well. The pressure that this object feels is going to be equal to the pressure it would feel if it was that same substance. So whatever this substance is, so we'll fill it in. If this substance was the same fluid, then it would feel that pressure regardless of the shape. So uh, it's gonna feel pressure coming from all directions. We know that the pressure is going to get higher when you go down. Um, the pressure gets higher with depth. Uh, so in this case, the signs uh, work in this direction. Pressure gets higher with depth, basically because you have some substance down here that's an energy density. It has to support. Uh, it's also a force per unit volume. This chunk of volume down here also has to support all of the mass above it. So otherwise it would start accelerating in some direction. So the fact that this substance here is not accelerating, this it's not boiling or something like that, indicates that it must be a higher pressure down here. There must be a higher energy density in order for this substance to be suspended on top of it. And again, for this substance to be suspended on top of that. The deeper you go, the more stuff is stacked on uh, oppressing this uh, portion at the bottom. Um, so the, the deeper you go in some fluid with constant density, 
the higher the pressure must become in order to uh, sustain or to maintain the structure in the fluid. Otherwise, the fluid would, um, things would start changing locations and things like that. So the deeper you go, the higher the pressure. So there's more pressure down here pushing up. There's less pressure up here pushing down. And so you get a buoyant force, a force that would drive you upwards. And that buoyant force is going to be equal to the force that you would experience um, regardless of the substance that's in there. Okay, so it'll be equal to, the force that you get is equal to uh, the force that would be required to maintain the same fluid existing in that same location. So you have a crown, for example. So you, you have a crown and you want to put the crown in the fluid. The crown will feel an upwards force that is exactly equal to the force that the fluid would feel to keep it in the, in the sus suspension. So the fluid that is displaced by the crown uh, would experience the same force that the crown will experience when, um, when the crown is in that location. And that's going to be equal to uh, basically the density of the fluid times gravity times you know, whatever the, the stuff is, whatever the volume happens to be. So that is how, um, that is how Archimedes discovered that this crown had the right alloy of metals in it or some maybe the wrong alloy set of alloys of metals in it was he was able to weigh the uh, he was able to determine the volume of this stuff um, based upon how much water was displaced but the Archimedes principle is also related to the buoyant force that comes from this so anyways there's that let's see what else there is in this particular thing because there's another equation that's coming up that's even more interesting than this than this kind of stuff so we talked about pressure we talked about density we talked about um uh, we did not talk about uh, cohesion and adhesion so that's kind of and capillary action so that's kind of an interesting uh subject uh not fundamental and in its relation to this material but it is kind of interesting so if you have a an atom or if you have a molecule that likes to bind to things, so water is a good example. Uh, water, so you have H2O. Uh, it's a polar molecule, so it looks like this. It's got basically a, what's going to happen. So the electrons are going to be, you can have like net positive here, positive and net negative there. So you're going to have this, uh, it's going to be a polarized atom. Um, it, will, it likes to stick to things. Water has this surface tension. It likes to pull on stuff. And so because water has a surface tension, two water molecules that are next to each other like to attract towards each other. They like to stick together. That is cohesion. Um, the fact that things stick together is cohesion. And the fact that these water molecules also like to stick to the surfaces that are around them, that's called adhesion because it adheres. So cohesion is a substance sticking to itself. I, I guess one could also call it autohesion, but um, we will call it cohesion because that's the, because of reasons. Uh, adhesion is its property, like the fact that it likes to stick to something else. So what can happen is, well, when you have water in a tube, you will get a meniscus, which is this curve that looks like this. That's an exaggerated curve. As it adheres to the sides, and it also coheres to itself. And then you're always supposed to measure at the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, but the fact that it crawls up the side is simply because water likes to attach to stuff. It likes to attach to the walls. And so if you squeeze the tube down, if you maximize the amount of adhesion that you get, then you can actually get the water's preference for attaching to the walls is greater than um, the strength of gravity. So you can overcome the water affinity to attaching to the walls can be stronger than the gravitational field of an entire planet if you get enough surface area relative to the volume of the water. So how do you increase the surface area to the volume? Well, we can figure that out. How do you increase the surface area uh, relative to the volume? Well, surface area is related to the size squared, you know, whatever the size, the characteristic size of your object happens to be. And then the volume is related to the size cubed with a three cubed like this. And so the surface area to volume ratio goes as one over R, uh, one over R without the square. Okay, so you divide these things, you get one over R. That means what? That means that the smaller, when R gets small, R gets small, that means the denominator gets small, which means that the whole fraction blows up. And so if you want the mass, the, the surface area 
is, so wh why do I care about the surface area to volume? All right, let's take a look at this one more time. Um, I, I don't know if I explained it the way that I wanted to, so we're going to do it again. The surface area is the adhesion force that the water is going to want to try to climb up the sides of the walls. So the amount of uh, adhesive force is going to squiggle the surface area. So adhesion is going to go with the surface area. The resistance to the water climbing up the walls is related to the mass. Okay, is related to this mass. The mass is proportional to it's the density times the volume. The density is going to basically be the same because water is an incompressible fluid, or, or at least for our purposes it is. And so uh, the volume is what's going to matter. So the volume is the resistance of the substance to gravity, or is the, the volume gives you the mass, um, which tells you how much the earth is going to be pulling on it. So the resistance to the water climbing up the wall is related to the mass of the substance, which is the volume. So now we go back to the surface area to volume. Surface area to volume, um, it's going to squiggle. The surface area of a cylinder is going to be related to the radius of the cylinder. The volume of the cylinder is going to be related to the cube, uh, the radius cubed. That's an R, radius cubed. That gives you the surface area to volume is 1 over R. And this is going to be the excess, this is going to be the ratio of the adhesive force pulling up on the water and the gravitational force pulling down on the water. So this is adhesion uh, divided by gravity. It's going to go like this. That's an A, by the way. Okay, so 1 over R. That means if R gets small, the smaller this gets, then this thing is going to blow up. And if it blows up, that means that the adhesion is going to be bigger than gravity. So when you have small tubes, here is a small tube, you can get water to actually rise in that tube without any help at all. You don't have to suck any air out. You don't have to do anything. It will. Uh, you have this thing in there, and the water will pull itself up in the tube uh, because of what's called capillary. Cap, capillary. Capillary action, which is the adhesion of the water to the sides, pulls it up, and then the cohesion of the water to itself drags the rest of the water up, um, and the gravitational field of an entire planet is insufficient to prevent this from happening. So that is capillary action. Uh, here's a question. Will I touch on laminar flow? Uh, that's a good that's a good thing. Um, so let that's a, a good thing to mention is when someone talks about laminar flow, uh, laminar flow. So laminar flow is basically uniform flow, it's not turbulent flow. So it's flow that is smooth um, in a particular direction. So when a fl the fluid that we're talking about, when we're talking about fluids in these pipes and things like that, which is what we're gonna be talking about next, uh, fluids as they move around, they have laminar flow um, as opposed to turbulent flow. Turbulent flow would be you build up these eddy currents that causes resistance to the flow, um, that slows things down. Laminar flow is a smooth flow of air from one location to another. Uh, laminar flow is actually really useful in chemistry labs because chemistry is terrible science where things can kill you. Um, you want flow to be moving uniformly in some direction. You don't want it to be mixed up because you might have some uh, terrible substance uh, that smells bad in your chemistry lab. And so you want to have the air in the room, you're working under the hood, you want to have the air under the hood moving uniformly in some direction so that it carries that uh, toxic substance away from you and up and into the hood. So uh, laminar flow is basically just smooth flow of non-turbulent flow of water substance in some area. Uh, let's see, is it is it that only is that only true? So speaking of capillary action, um, is that only true if the tube is small enough for the surface tension to override gravity? Yes, it, that's exactly right. So it's the surface tension overcoming gravity. Now this only happens. You can only get capillary action if you have a fluid that has um, adhesion. So adhesion. Oh, well, I guess adhesion and cohesion. You need both of them to get capillary flow. Uh, why? You need adhesion because that's what creates the force that pulls you up to the side. Basically, the water molecule here is like, oh, look, there's something I can stick to, and so it sticks to the side. And there's one over here that's like, ah, I can stick to this side. And so it sticks to the side, and then this water molecule is there like, oh, I can stick to this side. And so the water molecules are sticking up, sticking to the side further and further up. They keep seeing like vacated property. So they move up there. And then the cohesion is what drags the rest of the water up. The fact that this water molecule is attached to its neighbor, as these neighbors move their way up the sides, they drag these other ones up with it because they're cohesive force. 
So if you have a fluid that has adhesion and no cohesion, uh, for one thing, you wouldn't have to worry about this. If it had completely adhesion and no cohesion at all, then it would just stick to the sides. The fluid would stick to the sides and that would be it. Um, if you have only cohesion and no adhesion, then you actually end up with, uh, then the tube would fill up like this and it'd be perfectly level across the top. Um, you can have um, things where you have like the opposite of adhesion, adhesion, where like suppose you coat the sides of this thing with some oil, so that's hydrophobic, uh, in which case you wouldn't get a meniscus that looks like this. You would get, I don't know if they call it a meniscus, but you would have the thing would look like that. It would, boil, it would bump up like that. I think mercury does this already. In, depending on what the what the tube is made out of, so there are some substances where there's no adhesion at all. In fact, it's uh, it's whatever that surface is phobic, the oil phobic, or hydrophobic, um, and then it would cause the top to curve like this. In which case, that also would shut down capillary action. So that is pretty cool. All right, let's see. So uh, anything else that we want to cover in here today? Bernoulli's equation we did, applications of Bernoulli's equations, viscosity and laminar flow, Poussoy's law. Okay, we're gonna have to look that one up because I don't know what a Poissoy, Poissoy's law, um, transport diffusion, osmosis, and related processes. Uh, why does water stick to the walls? Water sticks to the walls because it has this, it's a polar molecule. So it's got a plus and negative, it's got a positive and negative side. And so it's gonna be, you're gonna get like van der Waals forces or something like that between the two. Um, if I think with alcohol, because alcohol is not, um, or like ammonia is not polar, um, I don't think that it has adhesive properties like the way water does. So water is weird that way. Um, you know, you have basically, if you look at the periodic table, you've got uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Um, what is it like? Boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine? No, fluorine. And then. Uh, I think it's just F, fluorine, and then neon. So these are the six things on that upper corner of the periodic table. And so if you just add hydrogen to all these things to, to make them all happy so that they have a closed P shell, then you get F, uh, HF, so hydrofluoric acid. Um, you would have H2O, you would have N, uh, let's see, what? So then you have NH3, which if you were to follow the same path it would be H3N and then you have CH4 and I guess you'd have boron tetrahydride something like this BH5 I don't know if it would if you could even do that um, but we could pretend that you would do that and that all these things would then have a closed P shell and so they would look like neon they would feel like neon when in fact they weren't actually neon um, and the difference is that uh, so this is just hydrogen and fluorine stuck together this one, water, looks like this. Okay, it's not symmetrical. Okay, it's got one symmetry, but it doesn't have symmetry in the other directions. NH3, on the other hand, does have a symmetry. So it doesn't have the, the nitrogen atom isn't poking out in any funny direction. And the same thing with CH4, you're gonna form a tetrahedron and the carbon's gonna be in the middle. So the oxygen atom is poking out in some direction and the hydrogens are poking out in a different direction with this uh, atom. So any other atom that you'd make with hydrogen along that same column um, would have this some similar properties. What would that look like? So what's below, what's below oxygen? Um, I don't know. Let's take a look real quick. E table. Below oxygen is some amazing thing. Sulfur. So sulfur dioxide. Uh, liquid sulfur dioxide um, would probably have a lot of similar properties to uh, water, except that it's not really a liquid. It, room temperature and pressure. Um, it's not, okay, you're claiming here that uh, creates surface tension, then the lowest surface area is created because the lowest stable state of energy law. It's not actually attracted to the wall is what you're claiming that The lowest surface area created because of the lowest stable state of energy. Okay, so you have, so what you're saying here is that you have, um, well, the lowest surface area is going to be flat, perfectly flat. It's not going to be 
um, something like this because as soon as you add curvature to it now you've added not only do you have this surface area but you've got that surface area to add to it um, so anyways uh, what is next what is left on this we've got so I've never heard of this principle before so let's take a look at this um, Let's take a look at this. We did capillary action, pressures in the body, so your body needs to regulate the pressure. Um, Bernoulli's law and um, onset of turbulence. Uh, Poisson's law. Poisson's law. Let's see what that is. All right. So laminar flow is smooth flow. This picture here is clearly not laminar flow. It's broken apart and becomes turbulent. So there's some, uh, it basically is how much uh, shear can a substance have? So if we, if we go like this, we have some fluid that's flowing in some direction. You you may get, um, as it, if it moves too fast, uh, or if there's some shear associated with it, like you know maybe there's some surface up here that slows down the motion of the air in some direction. And so you have air here that's unimpeded and you have air along the surface that is that is impeded because you know friction like different surface features or something like that then uh, that's going to actually cause the air to kind of spiral in and break it up into some turbulent thing so you have um, when you have a shear uh, through some fluid you're going to start to form if that shear is sufficient to break apart whatever attraction, whatever cohesion you have in that fluid, uh, you'll start to form turbulence. That turbulence is water flowing in the wrong direction. If we're talking about water or gas is flowing in the wrong direction, that's going to break it up and cause the behavior of the fluid to be different than if you have laminar flow. And so that is what is shown in this graph. You have laminar flow down here at the bottom, and then it comes up and becomes turbulent as, uh, as the air rises and accelerates and kind of expands outwards. It creates some of these shears that causes these uh, problems. Now, we need to find out what this um, weird French name has to do with anything. So here's an example of shear. Um, and you get this Coumray Q parameter, Coumray Q parameter. Uh, maybe that's not what this one is. That's a, maybe that's a different thing. Uh, the viscosity is related to, um, what is viscosity? Viscosity is basically the resistance that something has to, to flow. Viscosity in terms of how it is measured, it has Newtons. Anyway, it's got this weird stuff. Uh, I want to find out what this, ah, okay, so that's cool. So viscosity is what creates the shear. That, well, there we go. That's pretty, so in a non-viscous fluid, uh, there's no, you can't create a shear. There's, there's no viscosity. There's no way to create a shear. But in a viscous fluid where there's a lot of attraction, like the particles like to stay close together, like maple syrup, like sticky substances, like to stay close together and so you're going to it might stick to the walls and that's going to cause the, the flow rate to be different in different locations which is going to break up uh, so you can see that here okay so if you have no viscosity then fluid flowing through a pipe for example is not going to be it's just going to flow it's going to move like this there's no viscosity if you add viscosity that's going to cause um, the flow near the edges to be different than the flow in the middle and that's going to cause this shear to happen with uh, stuff in the center moving more rapidly than the stuff along the edges so now you have a shear and that's going to cause uh, create these turbulence uh, turbulent structures to form and that contributes to the viscosity so um, the more turbulent something becomes the more resistance that it has to the flow so um, that's related this will be related to a variety of things, including the chemistry, including like what are the forces that are causing a fluid to maintain its structure. So if you're talking about um, like a protoplanetary disk, uh, it can have a viscosity, a different flow, lit, flow rate at different heights in the disk, and that's going to cause turbulence, and that's going to cause friction, and that friction is going to cause things to heat up, which is going to change um, a variety of different properties. So anyways, viscosity is related to or creates a shear, and that shear creates turbulence, and that turbulence also contributes to the viscosity. I keep going back to that page and I want to go to this page. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, Poussoy's law, this one right here, Poussoy's law, resistance to laminar flow. The resistance to laminar flow of an incompressible fluid having this viscosity through a horizontal tube of radius R and length L 
is given by this quantity. That is, po I'm sorry, Poisson, Poisson's law for resistance. After the French scientist, probably Jean Louis, I'm going to guess that Jean Louis, but it probably it might not be J. L. Poisson, who derived it in an attempt to understand how blood flowed through the body. Okay, so there we go. Using flow rate, plaque deposits reduce blood flow. How about that? How does how would that happen? So how does um, the resistance change when you change? So you have some length. Uh, you've got the size. The size gets smaller. So if you have a plaque buildup in your blood vessels, the size will get smaller. That's this R down here. The R gets smaller, and that will cause the resistance to go up. So that's pretty gnarly. So there we go. Poisson's law. Okay, so this is probably a reasonable place to stop here. What does this mean we're going to do next time? And then I'll, I'll be happy to answer people's questions. Um, what does this mean that we're going to do next time? Uh, we will be talking about some amazing physics related to uh, temperature, thermal expansion. So this is like heat engines. This will be kind of cool. So the kinetic theory, that's like the actual motions. Now we're going to um, be talking about um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, there's one other thing that I needed to talk about before I move on to this. So the kinetic theory, ideal gases and stuff like that, that's going to be what we talk about next time. One last thing that I need to talk about with this block of material is the continuity equation. So basically energy is conserved, we know that energy is conserved, but there's also an issue of that material needs to be conserved. Some substance, the material of some substance has to be conserved. So here you have some substance, like your fluid, flowing through a pipe. And you can't create or destroy this substance. Again, this is stuff, substance with a constant density. So this is the difference between what we're talking about today and what we're going to be talking about next time, is that air doesn't have a constant density. Um, oh, that actually reminds me of one other thing. So let me, let me write up myself a reminder up here that there's something I need to talk about. So when you have a constant density, um, then the substance can't, you can't change the volume of the substance. Uh, whatever amount whatever volume of substance you have to begin with is the same volume of substance that you have to have at the end. And so if you go through some constriction like this, so you have a nozzle like that, then whatever, however fast this substance is moving here, it's got to speed up as it moves through here. It has to move faster, faster. The reason it has to move faster is because the amount of substance cannot be created or destroyed. At least that's the assumption going into this. And the density stays constant. And so because the density stays constant, uh, whatever the volume is here, the volume of this piece is going to be given by the cross-sectional area times uh, however fast it's moving. So you're going to be area times the velocity is going, that thing has to be equal to, so the amount of this area times the velocity is going to give you the amount of substance that passes by. So area times velocity is meters squared times meters per second. So this is the amount of cubic meters per second. That's the volume passing through this cross-sectional area per second is the area times the volume. That thing, because this has to be conserved, cubic meters has to be conserved, then that means that the little area also times this velocity here, that velocity must go up. If the area gets smaller, then the velocity has to go up in order for this equation to be satisfied. This is the continuity equation. It basically says that the stuff can't be created or destroyed. Um, it also says that the time rate of change of the, of the substance has to equal the gradient of it, is the actual continuity equation. That if, if you have stuff flowing out of a region, it has to flow into another region. Okay, so uh, this is something else to consider that the area, as the area goes down, the velocity has to pick up uh, for this to be conserved. Okay, so what does that mean when it comes to, um, for example, how does this relate to drinking fountains? Well, that's a great question, you might uh, say. Now let me put my reminder up here as well. Um, that's a great question. How does this relate to drinking fountains? Well, let's take a look at this equation that we had before. Pressure plus uh, rho, rho gh plus one half rho v squared is a constant. Okay, so here is a drinking fountain. Here is the water emanating from the drinking fountain. The water is going to go like this. And one thing that you'll notice at a drinking fountain, whoa, that's ugly. Oh, that's terrible. Is that the water goes like that. Okay, so here's the drinking fountain, and this is the aperture that the water is coming from. When it gets up to the top, the stream at the top of the drinking fountain is fatter than it is at the bottom. 
So you have like skinny thing coming up and then it gets fat at the top and then it comes back down and it gets skinny again at the bottom. If you look at a fountain that's shooting straight up, a fountain that's shooting straight up will go up like this and it will flatten out at the top. So if you go to the Bellagio fountains in Las Vegas, the fountains will look like that. Okay, and they spread out, it would be an infinite, infinite uh, disc at the top if it weren't for the fact that water has surface tension and, and cohesion and pulls itself into droplets, which then plummet back down to the earth. But a stream of water pointed directly upwards is going to flatten out at the top. It's, the surface area is going to go to infinity for that reason, right? Because you have uh, A, V equals little a, little v. And so the small area here and a fast velocity, when it comes to the top and the velocity goes to zero, this velocity goes to zero at the top because gravity slows it down, then that means that the area has to go to infinity in order for this relationship to be uh, preserved. Okay, the same thing's going on here. The water coming out of here is coming out with some speed, some velocity. When the water gets up to this point, it's now got this potential energy. It's got this gravitational potential energy. And so the velocity of that water has to be slowing down. And so because the velocity of the water has to be slowing down, assuming that the pressure is the same, roughly the same everywhere, the pressure is going to change a little bit with the height as well. Um, but as the water comes up, it's coming up with some speed. It's going to get to the top right here. It's going to have lost some, or it's going to put, take some of the kinetic energy is going to go into the potential energy, which is going to slow the velocity down. If the velocity gets slower, so if this thing goes down, then that means that the area has to go up. So the cross-sectional area on the drinking fountain has to go up. And how convenient that is for us who are going to go and lean over and put our lips on the water of the drinking fountain, and it's going to be nice and a fat blob of water in front of us. Uh, where if we stick our mouth like down here, where you're not supposed to stick your mouth because you're right next to the thing and the water is going to drip down and contaminate it, um, then you're going to have a, a, an uncomfortable, fast-moving stream of water that shoots right into your mouth instead of up here where you can slurp it up. Um, at your leisure. So that is um, that is how Pascal's principle makes water fountains work, including decorative fountains like the Bellagio fountains. Now, uh, the diagram on the right, yeah, so the diagram on the right, we'll do that one more time. Remember that um, what we, what I mentioned is that the area times the velocity is a constant. Okay, so the area times the velocity is a constant, so if one gets bigger, the other one has to get smaller. Um, so that's why the area times velocity, area one times velocity one equals area two times velocity two. Area times velocity is a constant. So if one gets bigger, the other one has to get smaller. Okay, so in the Bellagio Fountains uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, they shoot the water straight up like this. Okay, and the water will curve over when it gets to the top like that. And it will look kind of like this. Um, so why does it spread out? So all along here, down here, the water is moving very rapidly. So it's got a fast, a high velocity and a small area. It's got a small cross-sectional area. As the water moves up, the water is going to slow down uh, because gravity is pulling it downwards. So gravity pulls it down. Um, if you look at this equation, it's going to be rho, rho gh uh, plus one half mv squared. As this potential energy goes up, uh, one half rho v squared, then this uh, velocity has to go down in order to preserve everything. So the water is going to be coming up and it slows down because of gravity. And as it slows down, as the velocity gets smaller, the area has to get bigger. So as this quantity goes down, that one has to go up. So as the area gets bigger, then you get this widening thing. And when it gets to the very top, it should be a completely, it should be infinitely large plane of uh, water. However, water has cohesion. And so it's going to pull itself into droplets. And then those droplets are going to overcome you know, gravity is going to pull them back down, basically. Um, so as the water goes up, it's going to slow down. The, the size of the water fountain is going to spread apart, and then it's going to flatten out um, before it breaks into droplets and other, before other physics takes over, basically, and it plummets back down. The same thing happens when you, um, the inverse happens. It's exactly the same thing, but the other way when you turn on a faucet. So here is a faucet, sticks out like this. It looketh like this. Okay, here's your faucet. And the water coming out of the faucet is going to fall like that. Okay, so why does the water coming out of the faucet create this funnel shape? The answer to that question is, it starts up here coming out with some velocity, but gravity takes over and is pulling it down. And so it's going faster and faster and faster as it falls. As the water falls, um, because it's moving faster, you have area times velocity is a constant. 
And so as the speed as this speeds up, the area has to get smaller. As this one goes up, this one has to go down. And so that means that the area gets smaller as you go down. Um, so gravity speeds it up, the area gets smaller. Eventually what's going to happen is if you have a fluid that has cohesion, like water, then so as the stream gets more and more narrow, eventually other physics takes over the cohesive properties of the water and it will pull itself into droplets. And so you get a stream down to the point where the water is moving so fast that the stream would get narrow enough that the surface tension basically fragments the water and pulls it into the droplets and then it falls. So that is pretty gnarly. Uh, okay, now the last thing that I wanted to mention, and this is going to lead us into what we're going to be talking about next time. Next time will be uh, next Tuesday because I won't be streaming on Thursday. Um, but the, well, what, it just, hold on a second, that's terrible. It's got to, all right. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about next time, which is air and gases, gases behave differently than water. So, so far what we did today is we've been considering only incompressible fluids where the density density is a constant. Okay, now this is not true basically for any substance. You can always change the density of something by exerting forces and, and stuff like that on it. So there's actually a relationship uh, that gives you the density of a substance compared to the ambient conditions. And that is basically a relationship between pressure and density. So pressure squiggles density, or, or I should say, um, it's basically the density is some function of pressure. So something like this, okay? So this is called an equation of state. Equation of state. The equation of state is how a density changes with the pressure exerted on some sub, some substance. It doesn't necessarily have to be a density. You can partition the density into the particles and like the number of particles and its volume. So this is going to be the number of particles divided by the volume. Is some This ratio is some function of the pressure. So you exert more pressure on it and it's going to compress the volume. Um, and the question is how stiff is some substance? How resistant is that substance to... Um, changes in its volume. That is called the bulk modulus. Bulk modulus. Uh, bulk with a K, modulus that looks like modulus. Okay, so the bulk modulus is how resistant is something to changes in its volume from ambient pressure changes. So you change the ambient pressure and that's going to change the volume, uh, which will change, and as long as you're not changing the amount of substance that you have, then that will change the density. So the more stiff something is, the higher the pressure change has to be in order to change the volume which means that the density is going to stay um, more similar. It's not going to compress very much. Some substances, on the other hand, um, when you change the pressure, the volume changes drastically. And so that is the equation of state. The equation of state relates the density or the volume to the pressure. Okay, so the most famous equation of state in all of physics and in all of chemistry is called the ideal gas law. That is the pressure times the volume equals mkt. Okay, this is the equation of state. That's a K, by the way. As ugly as it looks, that is a K. So the pressure times the volume is NKT. If I divide by the volume, I get the pressure equals rho KT. So there's the density. This is the relationship between pressure and density. And this says that um, if you increase at a fixed temperature, if you increase the pressure, then the density goes down. Or I'm sorry, if you increase the pressure, then the density goes up. Um, and uh, let's see, so you, hold on a second. Keep this fixed. If you increase the pressure, then the density goes up. Uh, if you decrease the pressure, then the density goes down. This, so this relationship is the equation of state for an ideal gas. There are other equations of state for different substances. So water, even though it, we claimed it was incompressible in the last one, it's only incompressible in the, the fact that it does compress a little bit. The amount that it compresses is small compared to other physics that's going on in the system. So nothing is completely incompressible because otherwise you wouldn't be able to make black holes. So uh, finding out the equation of state is there's a whole branch of physics where people measure the equation of state of different substances. They exert a pressure on that substance. So I have a whole video on um, high pressure physics. You take these diamond anvil cells like this, you put some substance in there, you squish it from both sides, you increase the pressure as a consequence, 
by having a small surface area because pressure not only is it energy density but it's also force uh, per unit area so if you have um, if you decrease the area then uh, then that causes the pressure to go up so you have these diamonds with really sharp points and you put something in between it and you squeeze it uh, and the, the pressure goes up and so you can measure how does the substance uh, crystal structure change as the pressure goes up so measuring the equation of state of like neutron stars is useful for understanding like what's the internal structure of neutron stars how's that how's that going to cause or what's that going to cause and so uh, for an ideal gas this is what we'll be talking about next time um, assuming an ideal gas not all gases are ideal uh, and different substances are going to have different equations of state ice has a different equation of state than regular water um, gasoline has a different equation of state than water uh, alcohol has a different equation of state than water um, and so there is actually a relationship that is how does the density change with pressure for water and the answer to this is that it's a very weak function of pressure and so we treat it as though it's incompressible when in fact it isn't so that's something important to know that um, fundamentally all things are going to squish um, if there's extra pressure exerted upon them the question is is the amount of squishiness that it, something has important in a given problem and for all of the stuff that we've talked about and for like piping buildings and stuff like that the answer is no um, you just treat water as though it's uniform density when you're plumbing a building or designing at some large structure you treat water as though it's incompressible all the way down um, because we're not worried about pressures at the center of the earth uh, on the other hand with a gas because a gas is very squishy uh, then we do have to worry about the equation of state and so we're going to introduce the equation of state next time and talk about okay now how do fluids behave when there's actually an equation of state and when the density actually does change based upon the ambient conditions so that will be what we do next time which is one week from today so thank you uh, everybody for your time I hope that this was uh, useful let's see any questions here bulk modulus is related to compressibility yes bulk modulus is exactly related to compressibility it's like delta V over V um, it has is that what it is something 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 it's got units of uh, pressure basically um, hey faking the books how's it going um, so there we go that's the plan uh, nothing on Thursday I'll be back on Tuesday where we'll talk about um, the ideal gas law and then explore how does introducing an equation of state now that we have a compressible fluid what do we change so that should be pretty cool uh, thanks again everybody I appreciate your time I hope that this was worth your while